So, good morning. I am very happy to be here and to be able to give this talk today. So, I will start with this movie of mitosis. And mitosis, which you can see here on the, uh, on the slide, is one of the most fundamental processes of life. This is the process in which a cell divides its genetic material into two equal parts and then segregates it towards the two daughter cells. And the physical separation of the chromosomes towards the opposite side of the cell is carried out by the mitotic spindle, which is to me the most fascinating, beautiful, and complex structure in cells. And you can see the mitotic spindle here in green, microtubules are labeled in green, and the chromosomes are shown in pink. So the mitotic spindle has fascinated people since a long time, actually since the times where scientists could first, for the first time see the spindle. And here we can see the neat drawings of different spindles from Walter Fleming from the year 1882. So it's now more than 130 years that people are able to observe the spindle to see how it looks. But uh, after all this research that has been going on in the last 100 years, we still don't know exactly how the spindle functions because it's so complex and it has so many mechanisms uh, inside. The name spindle comes from the fact that this structure in most cells resembles the spindle that was used uh, to twist wool uh, into yarn. And this is how we see the spindle today. So the spindle is made of three groups of microtubules. And uh, these groups are divided by their function. So the first groups are astral microtubules, which grow here from the centrosome, from the spindle pole. They grow towards the cell periphery, and they interact with the cell cortex. The second group are the overlap microtubules, which grow from one spindle pole and interact with the microtubules that grow from the other spindle pole. And the third group are kinetochore microtubules, which grow from the spindle pole or somewhere in this region and end at the kinetochore. And the kinetochore is a protein complex on the chromosome, and it serves several functions. First of all, it serves as an attachment point of the chromosomes to the spindle microtubule. Then, it's a hub for the spindle checkpoint. And the spindle checkpoint is a process in which the cell checks whether all the chromosomes are properly attached with one side of the chromosome attached to the microtubules emanating from one spindle pole and the other side to the microtubules from the other side. And only when the attachment is properly done, then the cell continues with the segregation of the chromosomes. And the proteins that check whether this is uh, correctly attached are sitting here at the kinetochore. And also, at the kinetochore, the forces are generated for the segregation of the chromosomes at the end of the uh, nuclear division. So kinetochore is very important. And uh, in general, for the spindle, the main task of the spindle is to segregate the chromosomes without errors by pulling on the kinetochores. And here you can see an image of a chromosome segregation without errors. So all the chromosomes are divided nicely into two halves. But sometimes errors occur, as here. And uh, this has been measured in yeast. So in yeast, the chromosome loss occurs in one out of 10,000 cell divisions, which is quite a remarkable accuracy of this uh, nanomachine. And when the, such errors occur, this is called aneuploidy because cells end up with a different number of chromosomes, an abnormal number of chromosomes. And such uh, cases are connected uh, to genetic disorders and cancer. Uh, in humans. So this is also a reason why it's important to know exactly how the spindle functions and how it's able to be uh, so accurate. So the challenges today regarding the spindle are uh, not so much into finding the proteins that are involved in the spindle, because we now have lists of proteins that are important for the making of the spindle and the functioning of the spindle. Uh, about 600 genes uh, are involved in, in mitosis, and a couple of hundred proteins are uh, interacting with the microtubules in the spindle. So we know the names of these proteins, but what we don't know is how they interact to make such a complex uh, structure. So the first question is, how does the spindle self-assemble? How from all these proteins in the process of cell organization arises such a complex uh, structure as the spindle? 
And the second important question is what forces act on chromosomes? Because the final task of the spindle is to produce the forces to separate the chromosomes, and it's still not clear what forces act on the kinetochores to pull the chromatids apart and how these forces are regulated. And today I will tell you uh, two stories, one about each of these uh, problems. So let us start with the self-assembly of the spindle. So how does the spindle self-assemble? Well, for the spindle to self-assemble, one of the most important processes is that the microtubules, which grow from the spindle pole, somehow capture the chromosomes, because chromosomes have to be integrated into the spindle. And the pioneering idea in this field says that microtubules grow in random directions from the spindle pole. They grow and shrink and grow and shrink, and eventually one microtubule will grow in the right direction, and it will hit the kinetochore and bind to the kinetochore and then pull the chromosome and integrate it into the spindle. So this idea is based on the random uh, growth of microtubules in random directions until microtubules find their target. Well, this is a plausible mechanism, but the time required for microtubules to capture all the kinetochores, for example, in a human cell, which, uh, where we have 92 kinetochores, this time is longer than the, dura than the duration of prometaphase, uh, so the time that actually needs, uh, the cell needs to capture all the kinetochores, which means that other mechanisms probably also play a role here. So several mechanisms have been proposed since the time of uh, this um, pioneering work. Uh, so different mechanisms have been proposed how, um, how the capture of kinetochores can be accelerated. So for example, in some systems, kinetochores generate a gradient of proteins that stabilize microtubules. So the microtubules that grow in this direction will, will come in contact with this gradient and they will be stabilized while the other microtubules growing in other directions will disassemble. So in this way, the cell will promote the growth of microtubules in the right direction towards the chromosome. Then, another mechanism is that the microtubules are nucleated along the pre-existing microtubules in the spindle. So we have nucleation sites, these blue uh, circles, and uh, from there, new microtubules are generated, and this increases the number and the angles of microtubules uh, that are able to, to explore this space and eventually capture uh, the chromosome. So there are more mechanisms that can accelerate the capture. Microtubules can grow not only from the spindle, but also from the chromosome. They can grow directly from the kinetochore, or they can grow from anywhere at the chromosome in different systems. And these microtubules are then able to interact with the microtubules growing from the spindle pole, and this is then how the capture of the chromosomes is accelerated. And finally, the chromosome movements it's, uh, themselves help the chromosomes to get closer to the microtubules of the spindle. So the chromosomes diffuse a little bit inside the cell, and this diffusive motion helps them to approach the microtubules that uh, grow from the spindle pole, and this is also a mechanism that accelerates capture. So this is approximately what uh, has been proposed in the literature, but no one has looked before at the exact sequence of the events, how these capture events actually occur. Uh, it is very hard to look in human cells for the, event, uh, for the individual capture events because there are too many microtubules and also very many kinetochores, so it is not possible to see all the individual capture events. And this is what we decided to do, so we turned to yeast because there we can see each single microtubule and each single kinetochore and measure the kinetics of all the capture events one by one. And this is how a typical experiment looks like. Here we have a yeast cell. The cell is somewhere here. The nucleus is here. And this scheme corresponds to the uh, first image of the movie. Microtubules are labeled in green and kinetochores in pink. So what you see here is, the, the first of all, the spindle is here on the right side. This is yeast, so everything is very small, and the spindle is very small and doesn't actually look like a spindle. Um, but the important uh, object here is this kinetochore here. This is a kinetochore that needs to be captured. And you see the microtubule, and this microtubule has now captured it. So several microtubules are growing during the movie. You see them here, 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 these thin green lines. These are single microtubules that are able to search for kinetochores, and uh, one of them eventually captures the kinetochore. 
So let us think now about all the models that I have shown you just now about how kinetochores get captured. So do we see any of these models at work here? First, do we see microtubules growing and shrinking in different directions? Well, not really. Microtubules do grow and shrink to some extent, but they, they are not just growing, shrinking, growing, shrinking, growing, shrinking, and then eventually capturing the kinetochore. Neither do we see that microtubules grow from the kinetochore, and also we don't see any bias in the direction exactly towards the kinetochore. But when we first saw these movies, we saw something, we noticed something surprising that we didn't expect, and this is also something that I hope you can uh, by now uh, appreciate on this movie. The microtubules are performing some new kind of motion that hasn't been studied uh, before, and this is the pivoting or rotating motion. So the microtubules are rotating around the spindle pole here, and if you look at the microtubule that will capture the kinetochore, it first grows in some other direction, and then it does this kind of motion. So the microtubules are growing from the spindle pole, if the spindle pole is my elbow here, and they are performing this kind of motion. This is called the pivoting motion, or you can call it rotation, or lateral motion, or angular motion. So this is, uh, this is how we think that the microtubules are exploring the space, because this is much more efficient way to explore the space if you do like this, than if you are probing the space just uh, in a certain direction. So we have quantified the movement of the microtubules and the kinetochores. In particular, we have quantified the angle of our microtubule and how this angle changes in time. And we measure the mean square angular displacement as a function of the time lag, which is equivalent to the mean square displacement, just we are now here talking about the angle and not just about the position. And we see a linear relationships between these two things, and this means that uh, microtubules are performing random motion. So they are performing, they are doing this angular motion in a completely random way. Based on all these observations, we have now built a theoretical model to see whether this um, angular motion of microtubules and the diffusive motion of kinetochores can explain the observed uh, capture times that you observe in the experiments. So our model is very simple. The microtubule pivots around the spindle pole and the kinetochore also diffuses. And we have measured, these are the parameters of the model, the geometrical parameters. We have measured all the parameters. So in our model, there are no free parameters anymore, so the model can give direct predictions. And here is the key prediction of our model. So how does the fraction of lost kinetochore de uh, decrease in time? So it starts from one, when all kinetochores are lost, and as different kinetochores are being captured, it goes down. This is the prediction of the model without any free parameters, and now we can do the experiment to measure the capture times uh, in real cells and to see whether uh, this looks like something for, uh, like the model prediction, and this is, uh, these are the experimental data. So these are the data from our cells, and we see that um, in our model and in the experiments, it takes about three minutes to capture half of the kinetochores in the cell. And now it's interesting to compare our model that includes the pivoting motion of the microtubules with the original search and capture model. This model that doesn't have pivoting but just growth and shrinkage, it would take 100 minutes to capture the kinetochores in this system uh, without pivoting. So pivoting increases the capture by a factor of 30. So then we wanted to test our model further, but since our uh, microtubules are moving in a random way, and the, this movement does not depend on any motor proteins. It's not easy to perturb the system. So the only perturbation we could think of is to change the temperature, because diffusive motion should somehow uh, depend on the temperature. We don't know in advance how, but uh, we will measure. So these are our original data that I have shown you before, the mean square angular displacement as a function of time at our temperature of the normal experiments, 24 degrees. And then we either increase the temperature, the orange data, or decrease the temperature, and we measured again uh, the diffusion. So we see that there is a little bit faster this diffusive angular movement at the higher temperature and quite slower uh, movement at the uh, lower temperature. And we measured all the other parameters at these two temperatures to test our model and to see what the model predicts for the parameters uh, measured at these different temperatures. 
So here is for 14 degrees for the low temperature. This is the original curve of the fraction of loss kinetic course in a, as a function of time. And now the model predicts a much slower capture for the low temperature. And for the high temperature, it predicts somewhat faster capture. And now we measured all this in experiments. And uh, this is the data for the low temperature, and this is the data for the high temperature. So indeed, uh, the capture is much slower at the lower temperature and somewhat faster uh, at the higher temperature. And what is happening here is that the microtubule is simply covering uh, a smaller space at the lower temperature during its lifetime, and it's not able to capture the kinetochore so efficiently as on a high temperature when it's moving a lot and it's covering uh, some uh, substantial amount of space, and then uh, it's able to capture the kinetochore. So we conclude that the pivoting motion or this rotation of the microtubule around the spindle pole helps uh, kinetochore capture. In yeast, this is the main mechanism, uh, and uh, we uh, propose that uh, this mechanism also contributes to kinetochore capture in other systems, but different cell types uh, use different mechanisms. Use, every cell uses a combination of different mechanisms, but different mechanisms contribute to a different extent in each uh, different cell type. So, now I have been telling you about the uh, aspect of the spindle assembly in which microtubules capture kinetochores. But microtubules also have to capture either other microtubules to be able to make the spindle. And this is how the spindle looks in yeast. And we have bundles of microtubules in the spindle. This is one spindle pole. This is the other spindle pole. Microtubules growing from one spindle pole are in green. The other ones are in pink. And here we see that the spindle consists of parallel microtubules here near the pole. These are bundles of parallel microtubules, and here also. And here in the middle, with mixed colors, we have anti-parallel microtubules. And how do these bundles form? We think that our uh, pivoting motion of the microtubules also helps these processes. And we are studying this uh, now. And here you can see the spindle assembly in yeast. Tubulin is, labeled, uh, is shown here in white. This is one spindle pole. This is the other spindle pole. And you see how the spindle assembles and how the microtubules perform uh, angular motion during the spindle assembly. You see this microtubule and this microtubule, they both rotate until they meet each other. And then they pivot even further to make a, uh, to make a spindle here between the spindle poles. In the meantime, also parallel microtubules form because from the spindle pole you can see several microtubules growing in a parallel direction and they both do this and eventually they, they form also parallel bundles. So the angular motion of the microtubules or the pivoting is important also for the formation of parallel bundles and for the formation of anti-parallel bundles, which is altogether important for spindle assembly. And this motion is not restricted to yeast and it's not restricted to the microtubules growing from the spindle pole. So here we see an example of a Drosophila S2 cell, and we see how microtubules growing from the kinetochore perform angular motion. Here is the kinetochore. The, the pink arrow is pointing to the kinetochore, and this is a microtubule growing from the kinetochore. And you can see how this microtubule is pointing in the direction away from this spindle pole here at the first image, and then it turns, it meets the microtubule growing from the lower spindle pole, and then it gets integrated into the spindle. So this microtubule has changed its angle with respect to the spindle, and this has helped it to, uh, to get integrated into the spindle. And uh, so we think that pivoting motion also of the kinetochore uh, generated microtubules is important for the spindle assembly, but this has not been studied yet uh, in a quantitative manner, so uh, this is left for future work. And now a short break before the uh, second story. So the second story is about the forces that act on the kinetochores, because this is our second uh, important question about the spindle. And the key task of the spindle is to generate these forces that will eventually segregate the chromosomes, as you can see in this movie. Uh, many mechani mechanisms have been proposed so far how these forces are generated and where they are generated, but still uh, we don't understand how the spindle really generates these forces and how these forces are regulated to act at the proper place and at the proper time during, the, uh, during mitosis. So according to the current paradigm, in metaphase, when all the chromosomes are here in the middle of the spindle, 
The only objects that generate the force on the kinetochore are the so-called K-fibers. And these are bundles of microtubules that grow from the spindle pole and end at the kinetochore. So they bind to both kinetochores and they pull on them uh, during metaphase. So this is the current paradigm and we proposed um, a hypothesis that there are other microtubules that, that bind somewhere here, they connect the sister K-fibers, so this, these two are called sister kinetochores, and these two K-fibers are then called sister K-fibers. So we propose that these other microtubules link the sister K-fibers, and they act somehow as a bridge between sister kinetochores, so we call them bridging microtubules. So this is our hypothesis. Um, why did we propose this? Well, first of all, because we have seen such microtubules in live cells. So, so this is a live HeLa cell. Tubulin is labeled in green, kinetochores in pink again. And if we enlarge this part of the cell, we, we see here sister kinetochores. And if you look only at the microtubules, we see the K fibers. These are these thicker green lines. And then we see this thin line here. This is our bridge. So we can see these microtubule bridges in live cells um, uh, during metaphase. So we are not the only ones and not the first ones to see such microtubules at these places. Occasionally, these microtubules have been seen in uh, electron micrographs of cells of different kinds. Occasionally, so there are a couple of uh, papers where people have shown these images during the last uh, 30 years. So uh, this is an example from a, a blood lily cell. We see here two sister kinetochores. These are our well-known K-fibers that end at the kinetochore. This is one K-fiber, this is the other K-fiber. And then there are these microtubules that pass kind of in between and through the sister kinetochores. This has been seen, but no one has studied the function of these microtubules. It is not known currently whether they exist in all cells and uh, what their function may be. So we decided to study uh, these microtubules because if they are really there, they probably influence the force balance on the, on the chromosomes, so we cannot understand the forces on the chromosomes uh, until we understand uh, what these microtubules are doing. So to study these microtubules, we developed a laser cutting assay, similar to previous works where people have used uh, laser cutting, in which we cut the out outermost K fiber somewhere here and observe the response. And there are three ways in which such an experiment is useful. So first of all, if after the cutting, we observe something like this, so that this part is moving away from the spindle, and if we see that the K fibers and kinetochores and our bridging microtubules all move together, then this would mean that they're physically linked. So this will first of all tell us whether they're physically linked or not. Secondly, if this movement really occurs, then we will displace our system of interest away from the main spindle, where, and inside the main part of the spindle, there are so many microtubules that it's not possible to see uh, something clearly. So we will be able to study our system away from any interfering neighboring microtubules. And third, um, by the way this system moves, we will be able to uh, deduce something about the forces that are acting in the system before the cutting. So let's see an experiment. Here is a live human cell, so HeLa cell, um, and we do the cut here. You can see the cut here, and you can see how this movement occurs. The kinetochores and the microtubules move, uh, move up. They move away, and it's easier to see this if we zoom in into the region uh, around these kinetochores. So this is before the cut, we see the kinetochores and the microtubules. Here you see only microtubules and you can appreciate that there is a bridge here. So these are K fibers and this is our bridging fiber. And then after the cut, these uh, structures move up and we see that the K fibers, so one and the other, and the bridging fiber and the kinetochores, they all move together in a coordinated way, and this means that they are all connected into one uh, physical structure. So um, now we see that our bridging fibers are uh, connected with the K-fiber, and the next thing is, uh, that we wanted to do is to measure the number of microtubules in the bridging fiber. 
So to do this, we measure the signal, uh, or the turbulent signal of the bridging fiber and the K fiber to first uh, obtain their uh, relative number of the microtubules in each fiber. So we measure the signal across the K fiber. This is this tubulin signal. And we interpret this signal as the signal of the K fiber together with the bridging fiber, because at this location, the, these two fibers overlap. And then we measure the signal also between sister kinetochores, so somewhere here. And this is the signal of the bridging fiber itself. And we can measure this signal in many cells. And then uh, by using the known number of microtubules in the K fiber and the ratio of the two signals that I have shown you before, we can calculate how many microtubules are uh, in the bridging fiber. So it is known from electron micrographs uh, and the works of other groups before us that uh, HeLa cells contain about 17 uh, microtubules in the K fiber. And our bridging fiber has intensity of about 45 or 50 percent of the uh, compared to the fiber that contains of the K fiber and the bridging fiber together. So in the end, we get that the, uh, the result that the bridging fiber contains 14 microtubules on average. We have done similar experiments also in another kind of cell. This is a PTK1 cell. This is a cell from a red kangaroo. It's another mammalian cell. It's not a human cell, and it's not a cancer cell line. So uh, we have also observed bridging fibers here, and in this case, they contain only six microtubules. So, um, so from this, we can see that the cells, different cell types, uh, all contain bridging microtubules, but the number of bridging microtubules in the fiber uh, varies from cell to cell. Also, the number of the microtubules in the K fiber varies from cell type to cell type. So then we ask, do our bridging microtubules contain antiparallel bundles? We know that K fibers are all oriented, uh, that the microtubules in the K fiber are oriented with their plus ends at the kinetochore. So like this. And our bridging fiber may be oriented like this, that the plus end of the microtubule coming from this side ends somewhere here, and the plus end of this microtubule is here. This would mean that there are overlap uh, anti-parallel overlaps somewhere in the middle. And this is very important because the anti-parallel overlaps usually contain motor proteins that are able to induce sliding forces. So to test whether uh, we have anti-parallel over overlaps here, we use PRC1 protein, which is a uh, highly conserved protein that binds to anti-parallel microtubule overlaps, and it's shown here in green. And in this cell, we also did our laser cutting. So we cut here. And we see that after the cut, this green signal, which is here near the kinetochores, moves together away from the spindle, as in the previous experiments where we had tubulin labeled. And this tells us that here, this PRC1 signal corresponds to the central part of the bridging fiber, and that this central part consists of antiparallel microtubule bundles. And we have measured the signal of PRC1, this green signal here along the microtubules, and uh, we have seen that, uh, that the length of this zone is typically four to five microns. So the central part of the bridging fiber, the central four to five microns, are uh, antiparallel uh, uh, microtubules. We also wanted to see whether the bridging fiber contains growing microtubules. Growing microtubules can be studied by following the proteins that mark the growing plus end of the microtubule, and one of them is EB3, which is labeled here in green. And we zoom in on a region near two sister kinetochores, and you can see the images over 12 seconds of these two sister kinetochores here, and the, schemes, uh, the scheme uh, here shows uh, approximately what is uh, visible on these images. So first of all, we see the kinetochores in pink, and they, they stay at the same place during these 12 seconds. But then we see an interesting thing, and this is this green spot which is moving. So the spot appears from the left side, arri arrives from the left side of the left kinetochore. It passes the region between sister kinetochores, and it exits on the right side of the right kinetochore. And we interpret this as a growing end, as the plus end of the growing microtubule, that passed between the sister kinetochores in our bridging fiber. And we have quantified these events. We observe about two such events per minute uh, in one direction, and also we observe the events in the other direction. 
So based on this experiment and the previous one with PRC1, we can conclude that the bridging fiber contains dynamic microtubules which grow and shrink, and they are oriented in the antiparallel uh, manner. So to quantify the response of our system to ablation and to be able to uh, learn something about the force balance, we, we measure the contours of the K-fibers in HeLa cells and in BTK cells, and we extracted all possible geometrical parameters that we could, which are mainly different kinds of angles and distances inside the spindle. And the most important uh, result that we got from this analysis uh, when comparing the shape of the uh, K-fiber before and after the cutting is that the angle between the K-fiber and the major axis of the cell here at the spindle pole did not change after the cut compared to before the cut. This means that the K-fiber is clamped here at the spindle pole. It is not uh, able to uh, rotate. And the other angle, the angle at the kinetochore, so the angle of the K-fiber with respect to the major axis of the spindle here at the kinetochore increased after the cut. And this means that the K-fiber got straighter uh, after the cut. In the beginning, it's very curved, and then after the cut, uh, it straightens. So these were uh, important observations and measurements that allowed us to build a theoretical model. And we built the model because we wanted to test the role of the bridging fiber uh, in the force balance on the kinetochores. So in our model, um, we, uh, we, we model the K-fibers and the bridging fiber as elastic rods that merge here at the junction point. And this is the first model of the spindle that includes the bridging fiber. So the bridging fiber is the, is the novelty here in this model. We have forces acting at the ends of our elastic rods, so one force here at the kinetochore and one force here at the spindle pole. And these forces determine the shape of the K-fibers and the bridging fiber. But in our experiments, we cannot measure, at least currently, the forces inside the mitotic spindle in a living cell. But we measured precisely the shape. So we use the shape to calculate the forces by using our model. And in particular, we use the, as input to the model the measured geometry of the spindle, uh, the spindle length and width, and the angles at the pole and at the kinetochore. We also know the bending rigidity of the K-fiber and of the bridging fiber, because the bending rigidity of a single microtubule is known, and we know how many microtubules there are in the K-fiber from previous works, and from our work we know how many microtubules are in the, in the bridging fiber. So, so we know the shape and the bending rigidities. And from this, we get as output the position of the junction, which we cannot determine experimentally currently, and the model predicts that the position of the junction, this point where the fibers merge or split, uh, is one micron away from the kinetochore. We also get from our model the, the, the force at the spindle pole, so the force here, which is about 50 piconewton, and it's a compressive force. And we get the amount of the force on, on the kinetochore, and uh, this is a tensile force at, the, at this end of the microtubule, and it's about 300 piconewtons. So this is, these are the first predictions of our model. And then we wanted to use our model also to see how important is the bridging fiber for the force balance. So what does our model predict for the bridging fibers that contain a different number of microtubules? Well, if the bridging fiber has more microtubules, then there is the larger force at the pole because uh, you have a, a, a fiber with a higher bending rigidity, which you need to, to um, which has the same shape as the fiber uh, with a, a, a smaller rigidity, so the force has to be higher. Then this means also that there is a larger force in the bridging fiber. And how can we observe this experimentally? Well, if we have a higher force in the bridging fiber, then after the cut, we expect that there will be a faster straightening of the K fiber. So we decided to test this prediction by using cells where there are more microtubules in the K fiber, uh, in the bridging fiber, these here, and cells uh, which have less microtubules in the bridging fiber. And this is an example of a cell uh, or cell line which has, based on our measurements, 23 microtubules in the, uh, in the bridging fiber compared to 14 in our original cell line. So this one has very thick bridging bundles. 
And you see here that after the cut, there is quite a pronounced response. The response is faster, it moves faster away, and it moves to a larger extent. And the fibers get completely, uh, almost completely straight. So the response is much more pronounced uh, uh, than in our original cell line. And to quantify this, we measure the angle determined, uh, defined uh, by the pole, kinetochore, and the other kinetochore. And we plotted this angle as a function of time after the cutting. And if this angle increases, this means that, uh, uh, if this angle increases faster, this means that the uh, K fibers are straightening faster. This is our original cell line. We see some increase in the angle, so some straightening. And now, the cell line with the higher number of microtubules in the bridging fiber, here this angle increases much faster. So the straightening is uh, substantially faster. And we also had a cell line which had a smaller number of microtubules in the bridging fiber, but, uh, and, and here we see somewhat uh, um, slower uh, straightening of the K fibers in the bridging fiber. So based on these experiments, uh, we conclude that the prediction of our model was right. So, uh, um, so the, um, the bridging fiber with a higher number of microtubules uh, has a larger force. So the force uh, increases with the thickness of the fiber. And finally, we wanted to test how the tension behaves uh, after the cutting, the tension on the kinetochores. So the tension on the kinetochores, um, the kinetochores are under tension, this is known, and our model predicts the response of this tension and predicts that this response will, uh, will uh, depend on the exact location of the cut. And there are two scenarios, depending on whether the cut is on one side of the junction or on the other side of junction. So let me explain this. If we cut here, meaning between the junction and the spindle pole, then the connection between this K fiber and the bridging fiber will be preserved. And as the bridging fiber is balancing the tension between kinetochores before the cut, it will keep on balancing the tension after the cut. So there will, the kinetochores will not move much. The ten, not much tension will be released. And on the other hand, if we cut between the kinetochore and the junction, then this connection is lost. So the K fiber stub that remains after the cut here is not connected anymore to the bridging fiber. And the bridging fiber cannot balance the tension anymore. So then the tension between the sister kinetochores will drive their movement towards each other until the tension vanishes. So the model predicts that there will be a higher decrease in the interkinetochore distance in these cases than in these cases. So let's see the experiments. First of all, uh, here is an image showing, uh, images showing you just that the kinetochores do get closer to each other in a typical experiment. After the cut, here is the cut, here are our kinetochores, and they get closer to each other. This is also quantified in a graph in uh, more than 40 cells, so typically the distance between the kinetochores decreases after the cut. But does this decrease depend on the site uh, where we cut? So this is measured here. We have uh, plotted a decrease of the interkinetochore distance as a function of the microtubule stub length or the location of the cut. So if the stub is small, this is in this case, meaning we are cutting close to the kinetochore, we see a large decrease in the interkinetochore distance. And if the stub is longer, which means that the stub is still interacting with the bridging fiber, uh, then the decrease in the interkinetochore distance is smaller. So this is consistent with our model, which predicted that the uh, decrease in the distance, which is for us the readout of the decrease in tension, will be larger for cuts closer to the kinetochore than for cuts further away from the kinetochore. And we see a transition here at approximately one micron from the kinetochore. So from this experiment, from this uh, transition here, we can conclude that the junction is found somewhere here one micron away from the kinetochore. And this is now an independent estimate of the junction point. I have told you before that our model gave us a prediction that the junction is about one micron from the kinetochore based purely on the shape of the spindle before the cutting. And now, uh, based on this experiment, uh, we can also see that the junction is somewhere around one, one micron away from the kinetochore. 
And finally, this experiment tells us that the bridging fiber indeed balances the tension between the kinetochores. Because when, when uh, this bridging fiber is cut away, then the tension cannot be balanced anymore. And this brings me to the conclusion. Uh, so we have seen that the bridging microtubules, these ones here, link sister K fibers and balance the tension on sister kinetochores. And we propose that bridging microtubules have numerous roles in mitosis, which are yet to be discovered or shown. Um, and I can speculate that the bridging fiber is important for spindle assembly because it's possible, for example, that the bridging fiber forms first during spindle assembly and then kinetochores may interact first with this bridging fiber and then somehow move on it uh, uh, to get incorporated properly into the spindle. Then the bridging fiber may generate the tension on sister kinetochores because um, there may be uh, motor proteins here in between the bridging fiber and the K fibers and inside the bridging fiber itself, which can induce sliding forces and thereby uh, generate the tension on kinetochores. And also um, the bridging fiber may be involved in the sensing of this tension and in the spindle assembly checkpoint. And finally, uh, the bridging fiber may also be um, uh, contributing to the generation of forces for the final segregation of the chromatids uh, in anaphase. But this is all uh, uh, to be seen in our future experiments. And with this, I want to thank all my co-workers, uh, many, many co-workers over the years. So first, the ones that contributed to these stories that I have told you today, my students at the Max Planck Institute of Cell Molecular Cell Biology and Genetics here in Dresden, who were working with me while I was a group leader uh, here, my new students at the Ruger Boskovic Institute in Zagreb, our theory collaborators at the University of Zagreb. So Jana did the work on kinetochore capture, Laura is working on spindle assembly, Janko, Anastasia, together with Jonas, Geo, Anna, and others uh, uh, did the experiments on the bridging fiber. Bruno, Kruno, Anna, and Patrick are now uh, uh, continuing the story of the bridging fiber and studying the forces in the, in the mitotic spindle. And our the theory collaborators work with us on all our projects. And many, many people helped us with many different things. And uh, so I want to thank uh, all of them because without uh, great co-workers, it's not possible to, to do science. And uh, also I want to thank the Creation Biophysical Society for nominating me for the award. And thank you for your attention. Thank you, Eva, for this excellent lesson, and uh, uh, dear colleagues. Uh, on behalf of the EPSA Executive Committee, it's my pleasure to formally announce that the EPSA Invest Young Investigator Award was to Eva Tolich from the Ruder Buskovic Institute in Zagreb, Croatia for her work in cell division. EPSA received a very significant number of very high quality nominations from the national societies, reflecting the excellent level of research in biophysics in Europe, and uh, the decision uh, to award uh, Eva Tolich was unanimous within the committee. Uh, in addition to an, to an outstanding publication track record, uh, to Eva, this award follows some other prestigious ones, and just to mention a few, an ERC Consolidator Grant in 2014. She was chosen among, uh, among the 40 and the 40 uh, researchers uh, uh, by the Cell Journal, also an European Life Sciences Award as investigating, Investigator of the Year, and uh, a an, uh, human frontier science program also. And uh, I would like also to stress that Eva is uh, uh, strongly involved also in science uh, outreach activities. Eva, my sincere congratulations on behalf of HERSA and uh